Good morning, family. Um, Ron, my girls brought to my attention that you're stealing my introductory line and that you need to find your own. So, I just thought I had to pass that on to you. They're, they're judging you pretty harshly this morning. Um, we're going to be in Ecclesiastes again today, uh, specifically in chapter 5. Um, maybe. All right. So... In Ecclesiastes so far, what we've really seen is, as I talked about last week, this shift in uh, the author's kind of mentality or way of thinking about things. As we start the entire book off talking about how, you know, life is meaningless, it's all pointless, work is pointless, and and everything we do is pointless. And then in chapter 4, he starts to take kind of like an opposing viewpoint. Or he starts to develop an idea that there's some things that might make the pointless things worthwhile. And so chapter 4, he talks about the importance of community. How we're not supposed to be in this alone. And if we try to do it alone, it's like catching vapor in the wind. We find value in life through the relationship we have with others. This week, he's going to talk about how we're to approach God and how that adds meaning to our life. And if you recall, a while back, uh, I, we, we had a lesson on um, approaching the throne. We had a lesson series on approaching the throne. And I talked about how we have this oftentimes issue within the body of believers where we emphasize one aspect of God over another. And so uh, people will either emphasize that he's gracious and loving and a father figure, or they emphasize that he's just and he's God and he's king and he's creator and he's ruler. And, and so often we, we take a radical approach and we, we oftentimes miss that God is both and he can only be one because he's the other. God can only be gracious because he's just. Does that make sense? You see, God's justice declares that sin uh, demands death. All sin results in death. His justice demands a death. That's fulfilled through his son. He provides grace to us because he fulfilled that death himself. But that grace is only possible because he is just. Because what he says happens. What he decides, he does. When we approach God in prayer or in 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 service or in sacrifice, we have an obligation to remember who he is and not just some small part of it or the aspects of God that we'd like to call on right now, right? But to remember God as a whole. Listen to what the author says. Guard your steps when you go to the house of God. To draw near to listen is better than to offer the sacrifice of fools. For they do not know that they are doing evil. Be not rash with your mouth, nor let your heart be hasty to utter a word before God. For God is in heaven and you are on earth. Therefore let your words be few, for a dream comes with much business, and a fool's voice with many words. I had a gentleman uh, a number of... I can't say a number of years ago because I would entail that I remember how many years ago it was. But it was a while ago. Who talked to me about how it's okay for you to be angry when you pray. And he says, God can, God can take your anger. And so you can, you can rage at God. And I would submit that that is, that is just inconceivable to me. The idea that you would approach the creator with anger. And what the psalmist here, sorry, the psalmist, 
He wrote Psalms, but... So what the author of Ecclesiastes is telling us is that we have to be very cautious and reverent when we approach the throne of God. That we're to remember who we're talking to, who we're talking about. The, the, the concept of approaching God and allowing yourself to rage at Him is, is the definition of irreverent. It's the definition of pride. Entitlement. There is no aspect of our relationship with God that allows us to, in a sanctified, holy way, remain in a place where we are angry with God. You see, because anger is the result of injustice. It is, it is a failed expectation. Anger happens when we think something ought to have happened and didn't, or when we think something shouldn't happen and did. Anger towards God suggests that he somehow failed to meet your expectations of him. How can God fail you? When you are here because of him, Everything you have is because of him. What you have is a gift from him. What you don't have was with, withheld from you by him. We have no rights to anything. There is no entitlement for a Christian. Verse 4, when you vow a vow to God, do not delay paying it. For he has no pleasure in fools. Pay what you vow. It is better that you should not vow than you should vow and not pay. Let not your mouth lead you into sin and do not say before the messenger that it was a mistake. Why should God be angry at your voice and destroy the work of your hands? For when dreams increase and the words grow many, there is vanity. But God is the one you must fear. There, there is... Um, and a, a long-standing expectation throughout all of Scripture that God is a God of His promise, right? What God says, He follows through with all the time, every time, right? When we looked at this a lot, there's a lot of different aspects to that verse in Genesis 1 that says we, are to be, we were created in His image. He says, let us create man in our image. That means that our character should reflect the character of God. Who we are should look like who God is. That covers a lot of different things. That means we too are to be people of justice. That means we too are to be people of grace. That means we too are to be generous and benevolent. Because that's the God we serve. That's the God whose image we were created in. And it also means that we're to be a people of our word. When we say we're going to do this, we do this. Now, people uh, forget. I, I will admit I am horrible at remembering anything. I, 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 if I don't write it down, I'm going to forget. And oftentimes, I don't write things down like I should. But we're not talking about this. We're, what, what the author of Ecclesiastes is talking about are those people who make a promise or make a side of a bargain or a deal or however you want to view that and then make excuses for why they shouldn't have to fulfill their end of the bargain. Why they shouldn't have to keep their word to somebody else. We, we actually see this in life quite a lot. Quite a bit more than, than maybe we realize. Then the excuses for why we shouldn't have to uphold our promises to others are as numerous as the promises themselves. You know, well, I, I, I wasn't aware of all the facts when I made that promise. Or, uh, well, he, he wronged me and he owes me, so now we're even. Or, um, you know, I, 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 I thought I'd be in a better place to fulfill this promise when I made it. Or... You, you, 
come up with any number of excuses for why we don't keep our word to others. But what the author is telling us is that when God views a person who makes a promise and doesn't follow through with it, God sees a fool. And he says, it's better for you to just not make vows. Better for you to just not make promises. In... Verse, um, in verse 6, it says, Let your, not your mouth lead you into sin. I do not say before the messenger that it was a mistake. Why should God be angry at your voice and destroy the work of your hands? The implication here is that's exactly what's going to happen. If we are a people who make promises that we don't keep, what the author is telling us is, that God is going to be angry at our voice and he is going to destroy the work of our hands. Verse 7, for when dreams increase and words grow many, there is vanity. Is there, watch how much you say. That's, that's really the whole message of this first passage in chapter 5. Watch what you say. There are so many times we're in the heat of a conversation, we overspeak. We say the things that we shouldn't be saying. We make promises that we shouldn't have made in the heat of the conversation or the passion of the of the situation that we're in. And then later on, when we're of more sober mindedness, we realize that there were some things that came from our mouths that should have not have come. There's a lot of busy work and being a dreamer. It's okay to dream. But be aware, there's a lot of busy work in him. And that means when I say busy work, it's, it is fruitless work. Being a dreamer is okay, but that should not be your character. That should not be who you are. Because a dreamer is essentially people who make plans and then don't do anything with said plans. He says... Um, when words are many, there is vanity. Which begs the question of why I'm up here talking for 20 to 30 minutes. Because essentially what he's saying is, you speaking a lot of words doesn't serve any purpose to fulfill your dream. You speaking more words does not add more value to the words you're speaking. You speaking more words does not make you less foolish before God. So let your words be few. Let them be meaningful. There is a uh, proverb, a uh, Japanese proverb, that says uh, a, man's, a man should speak only when his words are more valuable than his silence. <laughs> It's odd how many cultures you can go to and see messages that, that we find in our own Bible. Verse 8, if you see in a province the oppression of the poor and the violation of justice and righteousness, do not be amazed at the matter. For the high officials watched by a higher, and there are yet higher ones over them, but this is gain for a land in every way, a king committed to cultivating fields. So, he who loves money will not be satisfied with money, nor he who loves wealth with his income. This also is vanity. When goods increase, they increase who eat them, and what advantage has their owner but to see them with his eyes. Sweet is the sleep of a laborer, whether he eats little or much, but the full stomach of the rich will not let him sleep. So this, this passage, we're really looking at the author's argument for us being a people of justice. He says, don't be, don't be alarmed when you see injustice happening. When you see poor people oppressed, when you see people treated unjustly, don't be alarmed by that. Don't be surprised by that. There, there are people that are in charge of those people. Now, when he says there are higher than that, right, in verse... Um, in verse 8, 
He says, for the high officials watched by higher, and there are yet higher ones over them. What he's really saying is, you don't be alarmed by those people, but be aware that there are people who are watching. All people give an account. All people answer for their actions and their deeds and their words. This is this is why I don't deal with worrying over over um, society as at large or uh, the political issues of the day. Is because at the end of the day. I'm going to do what they tell me, and they're going to have to answer to it from God. It's, it, 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 it doesn't amaze me when people in power treat people unjustly or act in, in opposition to their intended uh, uh, charges to their, the people who they're in charge of. That's been going on for the entire history of man. I take comfort in the knowledge that they're going to answer for their decisions. I don't answer for their decisions and their actions. I answer for mine. We are called to be a people who love justice, who who wish to see the the pain and the and the oppression of the poor and the um, disenfranchised alleviated. But we're not. We have no business being surprised. When he talks about how there are other struggles that come from uh, people in those positions. He says, he says, a poor man or the working man or the farmer, depending on, on uh, which translation you're reading, we're in verse 12. The uh, ESV uses the word labor, but it's as sweet as the sleep of the labor. It doesn't matter how much or how little he's eating. A working man will sleep whether he's eaten that day or not. This is in contrast to this. We have rich people who eat abundantly and don't sleep at all. Your what he's arguing is, is how much you eat, how poor or rich you are, does not alleviate your suffering in life. I said, that can be pretty tough, especially if you're somebody who's never been one or the other. Right? It's hard to see this, the, the suffering of people in situations you've never been in. If you've never been rich, it's hard to imagine what kind of problem rich people can possibly if you've never been poor, it, it's really difficult for you to understand the suffering of the poor people. Because the idea of not having a choice is, is alien. I've, I've experienced that with quite a few people. I've heard, heard arguments from people say, well, they should just go get a better paying job. Well, that shows the silver spoon in your mouth if you can say that statement. You should just go get a better job. That tells me you've never had to fight for a better job. Or they should go get another job. Spoken like somebody who's never worked a 40 hour week in their life, right? So it can be, it can be easy for a poor person to see our suffering, those of us who've gone without before to see our suffering, and very difficult for us to imagine what, what struggles could a rich man possibly have. Well, for starters, my life was a lot simpler when I only had a phone bill. Yeah, I'm, I'm far from rich, but my life was a lot easier when other people had no expectations of me because they thought I had nothing. You see, when I when I worked uh, um, when I worked factory work six days a week, working twelve hours of shifts, you, life was actually pretty simple. I had my job, and nobody dared ask me for anything outside of my job because it wasn't going to happen. I didn't have time for anything else. 
That can be difficult when when you're not considered blue collar because people think you have all the time in the world. Everyone just does everything for you. That's how that's how many of us see rich people. Like, oh, cleaning the house isn't a problem for you. They hire a maid, right? If, if driving is part of their job and they don't want to do it, they hire a driver. It can be hard to understand the weight of expectation that those people sometimes go through. The expectations to live a certain lifestyle, the expectations to uh, meet every demand that's made of them. Not to mention the weight of hatred that people without often have for people with. Yeah, I, uh, I don't know that very many of you would relate to this, but I was, I was into a lot of punk music when I was a teenager. I don't mean like Green Day punk. I mean like God Save the Queen was my favorite song kind of punk. One of the main messages in there was how our lives are miserable because rich people make it miserable. Life would be better if all the rich people were just gone. <laughs> Poor people will always be with you. That's what Jesus tells us. You know what's going to happen if all the rich people are gone? Well, the next set of people are now the rich people, right? If we get rid of all the all the rich people, guess what? Middle class is the rich people now. They're still poor people. You get rid of the rich people now, now there's no middle class. The low class is the rich people. Guess what? There are still poor people. Material wealth is not the problem. It never has been. Now we are warned that the love of money is the root of evil. That the love for money itself is inherently evil. But having money is not evil. Not having money is not evil. Verse 13, there, there's a grievous evil that I have seen under the sun. Riches were kept by their owner to his hurt, and those riches were lost in a bad venture. And he is father of a son, but he has nothing in his hand. As he came from his mother's womb, he shall go again naked as he came and shall take nothing for his toil that he may carry away in his hand. This also is a grievous evil. Just as he came, so shall he go. And what gain is there to him who toils for the wind? Moreover, all his days he eats in darkness and much vexation and sickness and anger. And he says the, the greatest evil, the worst evil he's seen is a man who has and loses. Having is not evil. Not having is not evil. What he's saying is the true evil in the world is a man who has an abundance and ends up poor. But he's getting to a point here. Behold, what I have seen to be good and fitting is to eat and drink and find enjoyment in all the toil with which one toils under the sun. The few days of his life that God has given him, for this is his lot. Everyone also to whom God has given wealth and possessions and power to enjoy them and to accept his lot and rejoice in his toil. This is the gift of God, for he will not much remember the days of his life because God keeps him occupied with joy in his heart. So what the author tells us here is in stark contrast to what church uh, history and tradition has taught many different times over the eras. Um, you know, we had a period of time where we had an entire group of people dedicated to this, and I think there's still some that can describe it to this day, uh, of uh, apostolic poverty. Basically, uh, if you're going to be an apostle of God, as they would name it, uh, we would say if you're going to be in the ministry, clergy, priest, preacher, whatever, then you have to give up everything. You should be living in poverty. <clears throat> well, Ecclesiastes says that if you have, enjoy it. 
It's okay to have material wealth and enjoy that wealth. That's that's God's gift to you. It's okay for you to enjoy that. Just like I teach team class because I enjoy being the smartest person in the room. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, Brandon. <laughs> I'm not sorry. <laughs> we fault people for the things that God gives them. That's not our place. Do we not fall guilty of calling what is good evil and what is evil good when we're those kind of people? <laughs> when we look at somebody who has material wealth and we say, oh, those are evil people because they're rich. But God made them rich. Have you not blasphemed the name of God? His character? Now, what Ecclesiastes is trying to teach us, right, the, the end all be all of this, is at the very end, verse 24, he will not much remember the days of his life because God keeps him occupied with joy in his heart. Look up at verse 7 for when dreams increase and words grow many, there is vanity, but God is the one you must fear. We have two different ideas in one chapter. One is that we have a responsibility to fear God. And one is that we have a, a, a responsibility to understand that joy comes from God. So we have no business faulting people for the situations of their life. The circumstances <laughs> they're in. We cannot argue God's providence and then blame a person for life situations. But also we have no we have no place looking at somebody else's life and feeling envy towards them because of it. We have no business looking at somebody who has something we don't and uh, Pursuing that, of holding that in, in higher regard or, or, or wishing that for ourselves because the fact is that's their life circumstances, their gift from God. And their joy will be found there, their fear of God will be found there. Yours is a whole different set of circumstances. And how can you possibly find joy in your life when you spend all of it looking at what everyone else has or does? How much time do you have on earth that we would waste so much of it on such a fruitless endeavor? In the midst of trials, God has blessed you. He has blessed you with everything you are and everything you have, and yes, blessed you with everything you don't have. Because believe it or not, sometimes God keeping things from you that you think you want is really God keeping you from trouble. There are a great many of us who wish, wish we were rich, and in all reality, let's be honest, if you made me rich today, I would not do well with that money. I would probably not serve God's kingdom effectively being a rich man. <laughs> Everybody wants what everyone else has. And we get into a world and a society and a culture where everyone is jealous of everybody else. And wanting to constantly look for ways of evening the playing field. But evening the evening evening the playing field, it, it it's never going to happen unless you start arguing that God's providence no longer exists. We don't like to preach these things. That if you're poor, God's will is for you to be poor. That if you're rich, God's will is for you to be rich. But the fact is, that's what the Bible talks about. That's what it's telling us. 
But the lesson is that you need to be okay with that. That you need to find joy where God offers you joy. And that whatever you have, or whatever you don't have, should be given to God. Should be used for God's glory. If you're rich, you have material wealth, use it for God's glory. If you don't have material wealth, you have to take what you do have and you use it for God's glory. Whether that be time, whether that be skills, whether that be workmanship, whatever you have is a gift from God and should therefore be offered back to God. And don't make the mistake of thinking that I'm the guy that's going to get up here and start preaching about the collection basket. We're not talking about the collection basket. In fact, I've already told the elders, if you want somebody to talk about the collection basket, you guys need to do it with me, because I'm not going to be the preacher to talk about it. All right? I think it's kind of a, a conflict of interest when the preacher who's paid by the church is arguing that you should give more money to the church. No, what I'm arguing is the kingdom of God as a whole. There are a lot of ways to give to them. There are a lot of ways to work for them. Whether that's helping out a brother who's, uh, who's in need, whether that's offering a service to somebody who can't do something for themselves, God's kingdom takes a lot of people. That's why he offers a place for so many people. That's why he gives so many different gifts to so many different people. Whatever you have, it's all meant to glorify God. There is no gift God can give you that's less valuable or less valued than someone else's. Our value comes from being a part of that kingdom. A kingdom offered to us through the grace Grace that is possible because of his sense of justice. Grace that is possible because of his jealousy for us. Grace that is possible because of his willingness to rule over us and our willingness to serve him. This morning, if if we can help anyone with anything, we, we want to make the offer known. Apparent. Whether you need prayers, whether you need to um, talk to somebody, or whether you need to be reconciled to somebody, or even your brothers and sister as that large, or whether you're looking for the waters of baptism to be washed clean of a life of sin, to pursue a life of repentance, to be re- raised up a new creature with a new hope. Whatever your needs are this morning, we ask that you bring them to the Lord. Stand.